Greetings and praise the Lord. Well, we're in our spring consecration. I hope many of you were blessed by the word of God that came on Sunday. And I'm glad that many joined even this morning with our early morning prayer. And don't forget, we're fasting from sunset to sunrise, 6 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. And we're spending that time also reading scripture and being blessed of the Lord. I'm telling you, I am just glad to have this opportunity to to concentrate and spend some time assuring my relationship with God. And I hope that you are doing the same. Well, as part of our spring consecration, we're having life impact every evening, Monday through Friday, with a word of presentation from the staff, pastors, and myself. I am certain that you're going to be blessed of God as we prepare to return to our in-person service. That's right, this coming Sunday, April 4th, we will be returning to our in-person service here at New Bethel Church on Resurrection Sunday. Oh, I cannot wait to see each of you who have been able to make reservations. I'm telling you, it's going to be a blessed and an awesome time. But as we prepare, because we will be having communion, serving communion in all three services at 9, 11, and 1, we will be serving communion. So to prepare for that and to prepare to come back to the house of God, we are coming into this time of consecration. Each night, a staff pastor will be delivering the word along with myself. And I'm telling you, we want you to be blessed. Our theme this week is Delivered for Destiny. Hallelujah. When we look back and consider how God delivered each one of us. Why? Because we must now be about fulfilling the destiny that he has set for us. Ah, come on. We're going ready to have our first presentation this evening. And then subsequently, each night we have presentations. I'm sure you're going to be blessed. Don't forget, join us with our 15 minutes early morning prayer at 6.15 a.m. And then also your daily scripture reading. Follow along on our website or throughout social media. Come on, it's time to receive the word of the Lord. God bless. Thank him. I thank our uh, leader, Bishop A. Glenn Brady, for allowing us the opportunity to share in his vision and to share with you um, um, what, he, what God has given us in reference to delivered for destiny. Hallelujah. And so let's go to the Father in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we just thank you once again on this evening. God, you're so awesome and so amazing. There's only one true loving and living God, and I am so blessed to be part of the called. And God, I just ask, Lord, that this lesson, Lord, be pleasing in your sight, Lord. Let what is need to be said be said, and let what let what needed to be heard to be heard and so God we bless you and we thank you and we ask God that the Holy Spirit have its way oh Lord in the name of Jesus and God we're going to give you the glory we're going to give you the honor we're going to give you the praise in the matchless name of Jesus amen and amen hallelujah as I stated to you my subject on this evening is part of what our bishop gave us to speak to you about and it's delivered for destiny and if I may I'd like to add a subtitle with just three words deception deliverance and destiny Mm. Deception is defined as the act of causing someone to believe something that is not true in order to gain an advantage. And I want to just pause briefly to say to you that there are three types of people. Those that please others, 
those that please themselves, and those that help others. And in this lesson tonight, you're going to hear about two individuals that went through all three of these phases. Hallelujah. But there are three subjects <laughs> of this lesson as well. And the subjects are a turtle, the apostle Paul, who was initially known as Saul before he became an apostle, and then myself. Hallelujah. So as I began, I was driving down North 51st Street one day, and I was approaching Georgia Avenue. And I saw crossing the road in front of me one of the largest turtles I had ever seen in my life. This turtle was huge. I guarantee it weighed every bit of 75 pounds. And it was about two and a half to three feet in circumference. And I was struck by the fact that this huge turtle was crossing the road in front of me. And so I pulled over to get a better view of this large reptile. And three questions came to mind. The first one is, why was this massive turtle in Kansas City, Kansas, crossing the street? Where did it come from and where was it going? Now, there are a lot of things which happen in our lives that cause us to ask and wonder why. And usually they concern more serious events than an enormous turtle crossing the street. Some questions that we ask why about is, why am I here? How did I get here? What was I thinking? And who can help me out of this mess? Now these, three que these four questions are in relation to before one is living a saved life. Hallelujah. Now these are just a few of the questions that we ask ourselves and we ask God when dealing with adverse situations that we find ourselves entangled in. Some situations which are self-inflicted and some situations which happen to us without provocation nor reason that we suppose. It's one thing to ask God why and it's another thing to doubt his goodness and his existence. Now there's going to be a lot of scriptures that I'll be sharing with you and I'm not going to ask you to go to them but I will ask for you to record them or write them down. The first scripture is Psalms chapter 10 and verse 1 and this is in the message version and the scripture reads God are you avoiding me? Where are you when I need you? And then we can go to Habakkuk chapter 1 verses 2 through 4 and the word of God reads, God, how long do I have to cry out for help before you listen? How many times do I have to yell help, murder, police before you come to the rescue? Why do you force me to look at evil? Stare trouble in the face day after day. Ha. Anarchy and violence break out. Quarrels and fights all over the place. Law and order fall to pieces. Justice is a joke. The wicked have the righteous hamstrung and stand justice on its head. Isn't it amazing how biblical times and biblical statements are so prevalent today with the exact things that we're going through right now, dealing with injustice, dealing with murder, dealing with police. Hi, how long, God, will justice stand on its head? There are some of the purposes for the deceptions of the adversary. These are some of the purposes. First of all, the adversary wants to make us think God does not care. Second, the adversary wants us to feel unworthy. Hallelujah. Thirdly, the adversary wants to cause us to blame others for our decisions. And fourthly, the adversary wants, us, wants to deceive us into worrying. But there are answers to these questions. And the Bible tells us in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 9, Haven't I commanded you strength, courage? Don't be timid. Don't get discouraged. God, your God, 
is with you every step you take. Hallelujah. We don't have to be concerned about those previous questions if we understand that God is with us in every step we take. Isaiah 43 and 18 says, forget about what's happened and don't keep going over old history. Hey, don't be worried and don't feel unworthy. God is making us a new creature. James 1 and 14 says the temptation to give in to evil comes from us and only us. We have no one to blame but the leering, sedu seducing flare-up of our own lust. <laughs> and then Philippians 4 and 6 says, don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns. Now, all of the scriptures that I'll be reading to you are in the message version, and when it's appropriate, I'll let you know when we're referring to the King James Version. Amen? And so when we're faced with confusing situations, pray for wisdom and expect to get an answer. So I got out of my car to get a closer look at this big reptile. And that's when I heard the sound of running water. And there was a nearby creek. And I surmise since turtles spend the majority of their lives in water that this turtle had to cross the street to get to the creek. And crossing the street exposed the turtle to danger. Have you ever found yourself exposed to danger either because of instinct or craving or self-will? Because of instinct, some salmon find themselves in the jaws of bears trying to get to the spawning ground. Because of instinct, male spiders face sure death while mating with female spiders. Because of instinct, African caribou will migrate across an alligator-filled river just to get to the other side. You see, animals are driven by instinct, but God has given humans self-will. Because we have self-will, God has placed in us the ability to hear his soft, quiet voice. His still voice of warning and reason. How many times have you disregarded God's still voice? In your mind, which declares to you, don't do that. Don't go that way. Avoid that person. But because granted has, God has granted us the option of self-will, we do what we want to do. Unlike the turtle whose instincts force it to get into the water, even at its own peril. As I approached and knelt to examine this huge reptile, it quickly retreated into its shell. I was observing its beauty, its size, its life experiences etched into its shell, demonstrated by scrapes, chips, and cracks. Another motorist stopped also, and he came running over to me as I was kneeling over the turtle, and he said, I saw that turtle first, but it took me a long time to turn around and come back. And he stated, that turtle will make good soup. <laughs> what I saw as magnificent, experienced, and deserving of life, someone else saw as food. Now, I'm not saying that this man was the devil. He was probably just hungry. But isn't it just like the devil to see what God has created for purpose to be regarded as food? <laughs> There's a battle for your soul, and Satan wants to, to devour you. Period. Job 1 and 7 said, God singled out Satan and said, what have you been up to? And Satan answered God and said, going here and there, checking things out on earth. Satan's purpose is to observe you on all sides to find your weakness and exploit them. Hallelujah. One of my weaknesses was the desire to please people. Whatever crowd I was with, I went along with so that I could be considered one of the cool ones. This longing led me to emulate the actions of those leaders that I was following, especially as they were using drugs. 
I wanted to fit in, and so I started using as well, starting with marijuana and eventually experimenting with all other kind of drugs, eventually doing whatever it took to get high. The ultimate drug for me was cocaine. And once introduced to it, my life started this downward spiral that I no longer had control of. And in the process of time, I became morally, spiritually, physically, and financially bankrupt as I chose to please myself. Hallelujah. See, Saul, who is the other individual that I told you we'd be talking about, started off as a people pleaser when he witnessed the men who he looked up to murdering and stoning Stephen. With impunity and to impress them, he took on their cause. <laughs> the Bible says in Acts chapter 7 and verse 60, then he, speaking of Stephen, knelt down, praying loud enough for everyone to hear, Master! Don't blame them for this sin. Those were his last words. Then he died. And Saul was right there congratulating the killers. It wasn't long after when Saul started pleasing himself in his desire to silence Christians. Acts 8 and 3 says that Saul just went wild, devastating the church, entering house after house, dragging men and women off to jail. Mm. You see, I had become a relentless addict. Saul had become a relentless persecutor. How do we fight against a relentless enemy that's always on the attack? <laughs> By placing his relentless spirit on us. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 6 and 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's the King James Version. <laughs> First Peter verse 5 and 8 tells us, be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Hey, glory. The devil sees us as food. That word devour originates from the Greek word kadapino, which means to gulp entirely, glory, which means to swallow up, to destroy. What must we do? We have to change our perspective of the power of the choice of self-determination. The devil is a liar and a deceiver. His whole tactic is to trick you into believing a lie and having you act upon that false belief. <laughs> While in the safety of Egypt, Joseph told his brothers who had sold him into slavery, slavery in Genesis 50 and verse 20, don't you see? You planned evil against me, but God used those same plans for my good and as you see all around right now, life for many people. Hey, what the adversary meant to destroy you, God uses it for your good. <clears throat> James chapter 1 verses 2 through 5, the Bible says, Consider it a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. You you know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and it shows your true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely, glory. Let it do its work so you can become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. If you don't know what you're doing, pray to the Father. He loves to help. You'll get his help and won't be con condescendent when you ask for it. Glory. Hallelujah. God knows the plans and plots against you. And if you trust him, he will use them to elevate you instead. Now at the same time, helping many others in the process. So we must accept the fact that it's not just about you. It's not just about me. It's about God and his glory. Hallelujah. Now, the second part of this lesson is deliverance. Deliverance is defined as the act of being rescued or set free. 
Go with me now to the book of Acts, chapter 9, beginning at verse 1 in the message version. And we're going to discuss Saul in greater detail. Here we have Saul, inspired by the stoning of Stephen, seeking approval for his mission of the destruction of Christians. Acts 9 and 1 says, all this time Saul was breathing down the necks of the master's disciples. Out for the kill, he went to the chief priest. Verse 2 says, and he got arrest warrants to take to the meeting places in Damascus. Glory. So that if he found anyone there belonging in the way, whether men or women, he could arrest them and bring them back to Jerusalem. Saul saw the people of God as food, something he was destined to devour. He didn't see their value. He didn't see their worth. He didn't see their contribution to society. He didn't see how their prayers benefited him as well. All Saul saw was food. Now, I saw the etchings of life on that turtle, just as I myself have the evidence, have the evidence of life on this body. Glory. Exemplified by numerous scars, by mended bones, artificial metal implants in my pelvis, from which I will always feel pain the rest of my life. See, life shows in the frown which I wear, not because I'm an angry person at heart, but because of the injustice and mistreatment I've suffered in life, some of which was due to my own decisions, and because I didn't have a real relationship with Jesus, I was vulnerable and available as food, glory. And self-will blinded me from the totality of my actions. <laughs> you see, Saul had set his own plans. He made his own decisions. He selected like-minded people that he needed to accompany him in his endeavor. It was his life, and he was determined to live it as he pleased. <laughs> then along came Jesus. <laughs> Saul went from riding high to laying low. Saul fell to the ground and I went into hiding, and that turtle retreated into its shell. Glory. At some point in each of our lives, all three of us suffered the indignity of failure. Plans interrupted and genes and dreams arrested. You see, Saul had a plan to attack the people, and God arrested it. That turtle had a plan to cross the street and get to the creek, and I arrested it. And I had a plan to live my life according to my own will, and God arrested it. Acts 9 and 3 tells us that Saul set off when he got to the outskirts of Damascus, Damascus he was suddenly dazed by a blinding flash of light. How devastating it must be when you can see your goal the outskirts of Damascus, and then God stops your plan. How demoralizing is it to taste victory only to have it snatched away by the jaws of defeat at the last possible moment? How awful to think that you are winning only to be blindsided by a knockout punch from nowhere. Acts 9 and 4 says that he fell to the ground and he heard a voice, Saul, Saul, why are you out to get me? And Saul said, who are you, master? And the response was, I am Jesus, the one you're hunting down. The King James Version states, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Anyone who made a living in ag agriculture understood the proverb, kicking against the prick. An ox goad is a stick that's used to guide the oxen in the direction that you want them to go while they're plowing. A farmer would prick the animal with this stick to get it to go in the right direction. And sometimes the ox would kick back against the prick, thus causing the spirit to go into their flesh, causing them more pain. 
the more the ox rebelled, the more it suffered. Glory. Saul recognized that language and knew that he had to succumb. Now, see, I picked up that heavy turtle and it immediately started lashing out with its claws in the front and the back. And it turned its head toward me. So I had to carry it out from my body. And I carefully placed it into the back of my van because I knew that if I left it there in the street, it would become somebody's meal. And I didn't want it to be to reach its demise in that manner. So I had to stop the path that it was traveling and change its course by force. Hey, glory. Jesus stopped Saul by force. Jesus stopped me using a different force, but force nonetheless. What is the first thing necessary when you find yourself that you've dug yourself into a deep hole? What's the first thing you got to do? The first thing that we all have to do is to stop digging. Stop your direction. Stop your intentions. Stop your plans. Just stop digging. Usually the process of deliverance isn't pleasant in the beginning because it requires drastic change. And change is not easy once you become accustomed to your condition, to your situation. Wealthy people fraternize with other wealthy people. Politicians hang around with other politicians. Christians gravitate to other Christians. And addicts want to be around other addicts because they are shunned by mostly everybody else. But you see, I was different. How was I different? I was uncomfortable around non-users and I was uncomfortable around other users. You see, I had given myself up to this drug life and I was determined to live how I chose. And like Saul, who was determined to live how he chose, I too had an encounter with Jesus. And I guarantee you that I too was kicking against the prick. Hallelujah. Some time ago, Elder David Hollis told us that everybody has a coat. <laughs> and I saw a, a sermon one time by Bishop T.D. Jakes that said, everybody has a light. Each of us has a light inside of us. And some people's light is just brighter than others. But nobody's light is brighter than Jesus. Glory to your name. And we all recognize that when we are in the presence of someone else's light that's brighter than us, by relinquishing. Glory to your name. So I'll experience a brighter light. I too experienced a brighter light and I was afraid of it just like Saul. And when I approached the turtle, it retreated into its shell because of fear as well. Saul retreated and fell to the ground. I retreated and ran and the turtle retreated into its shell. Not too much of a difference there. Now for us to hear, our attention must be gained and when Jesus has our focus, then he can speak to us. Glory. Acts 9 and 6, Jesus told Saul, I want you to get up and enter the city and in the city you will be told what to do next. Just stay with me. I'm going somewhere with this. Jesus told me to get out of the city and stay with family. Get away from the people that you're hanging with. They want to do you harm. And then Jesus, through a prophet, described the people that wanted to harm me. And it was at that point that I knew that this thing was real. And I left the city. The Bible says that in Acts chapter 9, his companions stood there dumbstruck. They heard the voice, but they didn't know where the sound came from. You see, your deliverance is just for you. How God speaks, what he says is specifically tailored for your attention. And whatever means he uses to get his will across will be determined by the resistance that you put up when he is trying to get your attention. Now, during the event of your deliverance, no one else will understand. You see, those who used to do drugs with you won't understand that you're no longer doing drugs. Those that didn't do drugs won't understand that you're no longer doing drugs. And those that you wronged when you did drugs won't believe that you're delivered. 
because of all the pain that you've caused. And what I've learned is that when the people of God seem to have the hardest time forgiving an individual. <laughs> but you see, God reserves one ram in the bush. And believe me, it was those individuals that were there with Saul. It was the family member that allowed me to live in their home while God was making other arrangements for my deliverance. One person is always committed in any way possible to assist you in your transformation from death to life. One person that God has in preparation to help save you. Mm. Acts 9 and chapter 8, the, ver the Bible says, while Saul, picking himself up off the ground, found himself stone blind. And they that were with him had to take him by the hand and lead him into Damascus. See, Psalms 46 and 10 says, step out of the traffic. Take a long, loving look at me, your high God, above politics, above everything. The King James Version says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Hallelujah. Deliverance can be confusing. Deliverance can be scary. Deliverance can be brutal. But it is necessary to advance you to the next level, the next plane, the next plateau, which is your destiny. Glory. Glory. Now we're in the last session. Mm. Destiny. Destiny is defined as the events that will necessarily happen to a particular person or thing in the future. Jeremiah 29 and 11 says, I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out. Plans to take care of you, not abandon you. Plans to give you a future you hope for. Glory. Man may have desired destinations. Man may have goals they want to achieve. But only God knows your destiny. Man can plan, but God knows. Romans 8 and 28, the word of God says, that's why we can be so sure that every detail of our lives of love for God is worked into something good. The King James Version says it like this, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. You see, only God knows the future so it stands to reason that he knows our future. What an amazing thing to place our future in the hands of Jesus and experience unspeakable joy because of leaving our own life, our plans and our goals to the control of Jesus and learning, hallelujah, that everything he said to us is true. Hallelujah. Everything we heard about Jesus is true. Mm. So you see, after Saul followed the instructions he received on that road to Damascus, his life was altered completely. He recognized that the greater light had a greater plan for him. He realized that persecuting the followers of Jesus was the wrong path and that this revelation not only saved Saul, but countless other believers who have put their faith and trust in Jesus were saved in the process. Saul, who became Paul, went on to write the majority of the New Testament. And here is an example of my favorite verse of the transforming love of Jesus demonstrated by Paul's letter in Romans. Romans 12 and 1 says, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday ordinary life. You're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work, you're walking around life. And place it before God as an offering. Hallelujah. Embracing what God has, what God does for you is the best thing that you could do for him. I'm going to say that again. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. And verse 12 and 2 says, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Mm. 
Instead, fix your attention on God. You will be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out in you, develops well-formed maturity in you. My future as a drug addict was destined for the hospital, destined for prison, and destined for death. It was changed by the one who knew more about me than I knew about myself. Jesus knew the future I chose wasn't the future he chose. And his spiritual intervention was necessary to get me on track toward his destiny for me. Hmm. You see, I took that turtle home and I released it into the creek next to my house. I observed that because of the water, a transformation took place. Because of the water, no longer was this turtle a lumbering, meandering, scared creature exposed to the destructive forces of the world, slowly struggling to get across that street. Because of the water, this creature is agile and can move quickly in this safe environment. You see, God sent me to free that turtle from certain death. God sent Ananias to do the same for Saul. And God sent A. Glenn Brady to New Bethel to do the same for New Bethel. The Bible says in Acts chapter 9, verses 17 and 18, so Ananias went and found the house, placed his hands on blind Saul, and said, Brother Saul, the master sent me. The same Jesus you saw on your way here, he sent me so you could see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And verse 19 says, No sooner were the words out of his mouth than something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. He could see again. He got to his feet and was baptized. Hallelujah. The first thing he did was recognize a change that he knew he needed to be baptized. God allowed me the opportunity to change the turtle's destiny from death in the boiling pot to the water flowing with life. God sent me to New Bethel to get a full understanding of the power of salvation through Jesus Christ. The water provides protection. The water provides food. The water provides life. And what is this water? This water is Jesus Christ. John 4 and 14 says, Anyone who drinks the water I give will never thirst, not Ever. The water I give will be an artesian spring within, gushing fountains of endless life. Glory to your name. John 7 and 37 says, On the final and climactic day of the feast, Jesus took his stand. He cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Isaiah 12 and 3 says, Joyfully you'll pull up buckets of water from the wells of salvation. Hey, God knew a pandemic was in our future. He redefined our plans for the future. A new sanctuary with new financial obligations may have been too much to handle and we could have suffered because of the strain. <laughs> During this season of COVID-19, the adversary has destroyed many. Some saved and some not saved. But thanks be to God, New Bethel hasn't lost not one member to the pandemic. Like Paul and the ship, when it wrecked in Malta, none were lost. Glory be to God. Acts 28 and 1 says, Once everyone was accounted for, and we realized we all had made it, we learned that we were on the island of Malta. Malta is the Greek word for melita, which means honey. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Although several members have contracted the virus, once again, just like Paul on the island of Malta, when he was bitten by a poisonous snake, the act, Acts chapter 25 says, Paul shook the snake off into the fire, none the worse for wear. The saints of New Bethel shook off COVID-19, none the worse for wear. With the help of Jesus, hallelujah, glory be to God, none the worse for wear. <laughs>
Isaiah 12 and 2 says, yes, indeed, God is my salvation. I trust. I won't be afraid. God, yes, God is my strength. And song, best of all, my salvation. Isaiah 12 and 4 says, as you do it, you'll say, give thanks to God. Call out his name. Ask him anything. Shout to the nations. Tell them what he's done. Spread the news of his great reputation. Verse 5 says, sing praises, songs to God. He's done it all. Let the whole earth know what he's done. Now I have to start ending and I want to leave you with this. On that road to Damascus when Saul asked, who are you, Lord? Jesus responded, I am Jesus. Jesus declared, I am. Exodus 3 and 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. Tell the people of Israel, I am sent me to you. John 14 and 6, Jesus said, I am the road, also the truth, also the life. No one gets to the Father apart from me. John 8 and 58 says, believe in me said Jesus. I am who I am long before Abraham was anything. Revelations 1 and 8 says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come the Almighty. Revelations 1 and 8 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. John 11 to 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet he shall live. John 8 and 12, then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Jesus is saying to all of us, I am. COVID-19 is, but I am. Alcoholism is, but I am. Addiction is, but I am. Am. Murder is, but I am. Robbery is, but I am. Disobedience is, but I am. Depression is, but I am. Worry is, but I am. Domestic violence is, but I am. Sexual immorality is, but I am. Fear is, but I am. Slothfulness is, but I am. Injustice is, but I am. Lying is, but I am. Cheating is, but I am. Silence is, but I am. I am the Alpha. I am the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. Revelations 21 and 6 says, then he says, it's happened. I'm A to Z. I'm the beginning. I'm the conclusion. From water of life, well, I give freely to the thirsty. The great I am is our deliverer. The great I am is our redeemer. And the great I am will change your life. <laughs> Delivered for destiny. Saved for God's future, not our future. Play my strength in the Lord. Hallelujah. New Bethel Church family, we pray you were blessed by the worship and the word of life on today. If you need prayer, encouragement, or if you feel a tug at your heart, we encourage you to call our church office or even email us. We have ministers and those waiting to pray with you, to encourage you, and to help you with the next steps of salvation according to the Word of God. You may also even join the ministry even in the midst of a pandemic. The New Bethel Church is striving to meet the needs of our families and our community in any way that we can. If you would like to sow into this ministry, you may do so online on our website at newbethelkc.org by using the Givelify app and searching New Bethel, Kansas City, Kansas. 
you may also mail in your gifts or drop them by during the church office hours, Tuesday through Friday. Now we do not want the ministry to stop here. We encourage you to connect and be a part of our weekly services. We have a prayer call with Pastor Brady every Tuesday and Thursday morning at 6.15 a.m. We also have Life Impact Bible Study live on our Facebook page at 7 p.m. on Wednesdays. Also on Wednesdays, we offer a food pantry in connection with Harvesters, and it is from 2 to 4 p.m. Our YouTube channel is a great ministry tool that we are able to use to provide services and lessons for adults and children. New Bethel KC TV, connect with us and share those with other family members and friends. Now you may find more information about upcoming events on our website at newbethelkc.org or simply by searching our social media tags at New Bethel KC. We look forward to seeing you again next Sunday.